Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster, co creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award winning blog, and service organization helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another conversation with the Parenting with Impact podcast. We are really excited to be with you today and to have a really interesting conversation. Our guest is Dr. Matt Zakreski. Did I pronounce that right? You got that right. Excellent. Yay. First try in everything. I should have checked with you, but I didn't. <laughs> and Matt, just so you know, we don't do bios and all that stuff. It's in the show notes and we find it a little boring. boring. Bio <laughs> boring. Who wants to listen to that? <laughs> right. But we will tell you that he's a clinical psychologist who specializes in working with gifted TUI and neurodiverse kids and teens and families. And so you can tell why he's here because he's one of us, right? One he's in our of us. <laughs> yeah, and we found that out in the pre-show, but that's a whole other conversation. Right. So. Really one of us. All right. So let's get started. Oh, yeah. So okay. Matt, tell us a little bit about how you got where you are and, and are doing what you're doing. So my origin story actually starts in second grade. I was in my second grade classroom at Knollwood Elementary School in beautiful Fairhaven, New Jersey. And they sent us home with a math workbook and they told us to do pages one through four. And I went home and I did pages one through four. And I said, well, that was easy. And like very far scum, right? I'm just going to keep going. And I finished pages 10 and 20. And then I finished the book. So the next day I brought it in and I gave it to my, my teacher, Miss Vaughn. And she said, what's this? I said, I finished the book. And then they sent me to the principal's office and, you know, they were like, so who helped you with this? I was nobody helped me with this. Well, how did you find the answers? I didn't find the answers. Right. I mean, and also I'm a child of the eighties, so there was no internet. It's not like I like look Google right. it. Right. I just right. did the math. You just did it. Math. Right. I just did the math. Funny yeah. that. Right. And so, you know, parent meeting and my parents were explaining to me that I'm a gifted kid and that's what that means. And so my first taste of this story is that, I can do something exceptional. I got in trouble for it. And it meant that I was different. And by the way, they responded to it by giving me another math workbook. Of, the <laughs> of same course stuff, they did. Right? So <laughs> it's like, no. So fast forward many years, I become, you know, I get into graduate school. I'm working at a school for neurodiverse kids and it just clicks. Like, these are my people. This is what I should be doing. So, you know, I've spent a little bit more than the last decade working with neurodiverse kids and their families and schools and becoming an advocate in this wonderful community. And, you know, I think like a lot of us, I'm riding the wave of the neurodiversity movement, but, you know, at the risk of sounding a little bit hipster, I was here before it was cool. So yeah, we're, we're right there with you. Yep. But so let me ask you a question about yeah. that because you were identified as gifted and I, and I have a whole theory about what happens when kids are identified as gifted first versus challenged first, right? So when we talk about two E kids, remember everybody, twice exceptional, mm -hmm. these are kids who are gifted and challenged. Yep. And if we start by experiencing the challenge first, we tend to respond one way. And if we start by seeing the gift first, we tend to respond another. So when was the flip side of the gift found for you? Well, and that's a phenomenal question. So like a lot of people in the gifted community, I'm twice exceptional. I have ADHD as well. So what that meant is that stuff that was easy for me was super, super easy and stuff that I didn't want to do. I didn't really do, but because I was so smart, I could sort of skate by. Yeah. And there's this phenomenon in education. We call it the performance cliff. Basically, the idea is that if you're this smart, sooner or later, school gets harder than you are smart and you fall off a cliff because neurotypical kids are building those coping strategies throughout their childhood, right? They have to learn how to study. They have to learn how to ask for help. They have to learn resiliency. Whereas if, you know, if you're super, super smart, you sort of skate by and float by. 
And then all of a sudden it's eighth grade or 10th grade or 11th grade. And you're having to learn all of these skills, building the plane while you fly it, except the stakes are super high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, so I distinctly remember in eighth grade, that was when I hit the cliff. Right. And I had to learn how my teachers would say, well, you know, you know, you need to study. And I would look at them in all authenticity and say, what does that mean? Like, I don't like look through the book in the three minutes before class. Like, no, spend several days looking over that. That doesn't make sense. That's not a thing. What? That's a thing. Really? So. Well, and and what you're describing is really a classic situation. A lot of kids with ADHD have a very low threshold for frustration, right? No frustration tolerance. And it's because what you're describing is when things come quickly, they haven't learned the patience of learning. They haven't cultivated the patience to slow down the process of learning. And that can be really frustrating. Go ahead. And add on to that, the fact that these kids are three to five years behind their peers in terms of their executive function development. So when they're teaching the skills in class, not only are they thinking about something else, but they're not even ready to learn the skills yet. Right. And so the concept I love, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit is go back and catch them up. Right. It's that sort of getting them up, how to help a kid who's super smart, learn a skill when they don't really think that they need the skill or even understand the skill. Yep. I mean, right. fundamentally, so much of this is about meeting kids where they are. And it's an easy thing to say, but it's a hard thing to do because it involves a having good data that you can scale where you need to know where this kid is, but also having the relationship with the kid where you can say, I need to teach you this thing, but the best way for me to teach you this thing is to do it this way. And I need you to trust me that that's the right way to do it. You know, because otherwise what we end up telling kids is next time this thing happens, do that. And they go, mm-hmm. okay, because they yes you to death. And then the next time they're in that situation, they don't either don't remember or they can't access it. They've never practiced it. So mm-hmm. I cannot tell you how many times people handed me a planner and said, this will help. And I said, cool. <laughs> you know? Don't get us started on planners. It's one of our like biggest a, jokes is, is yeah. the world of planners and how the world the of focus planners. on the big oh, the focus on the, on the yeah. The other flavor that kind of comes in here is the school system, I got to be honest, and say kind of their acknowledgement and acceptance. And I'm assuming that they're better. I have college age kids now, and, and so things are different. But I remember really distinctly my daughter in third grade, over the charts gifted and behaviorally was not ready for the gifted class. And so they're like, well, we want her behavior to get better before we'll put her in the gifted program. And what she needed was to be in the gifted program so that her behavior would get better. I mean, it was this sort of opposite thing that I don't, I mean, you're in this more than we are every day, Matt. Our school's getting better at recognizing 2E and supporting 2E in a different way than they were 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago when my kiddo was going through. So yes, I mean, like, I think there's been a lot of improvement. There's a lot more knowledge out there. We're not where we need to be, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, so much of this neurodiversity movement is about honoring kids' strengths and differences, not setting them through the deficit model, right? Mm -hmm. Right. When I do an evaluation of a kid, I say, my job isn't to figure out how smart you are. My job is to figure out how your brain works. Right. Because when I know how your brain works, I can tell school, give this kid this thing and other things will get better. And I, Diane, I love what you said, because that is one of my biggest pieces of advocacy. You know, the, a school will say to me, well, this kid's not getting good grades, so they can't be in the gifted program. I said, put this kid in a gifted program, watch them get great grades. I, There's yeah. not enough challenge. They're not engaged in it. And I say, give me a semester, give me a marking period. Right. And this kid will crush it. And I'm always happy to put myself on the line for that because I know how these kids work, A, because I was one, and also because we know a lot about these kids, yeah. right? Unfortunately, a lot of teachers and administrators don't. So that's part of no. my job. Right. Well, in so many different directions I'd want to go because, you know, my son, same story, high school, right? So now it was about whether or not to get put him in a, the equivalent of an AP class. Mm-hmm. And I literally threatened to pull him out of the school. And the principal was shocked. And I was furious because it was it was that scenario of make him prove himself so that he can earn the privilege instead of, you guys, he's interested in that. He's motivated because he's interested. Let's give him an opportunity to express what he's interested in. Yeah. And what's, what's coming up as we're having this conversation is this question about, and I've been wondering, like, 
are most kids or most neurodiverse complex kids on some level to eat? Like, is that more common than we even realize? So it is more common than we realize. I mean, there's an interesting intersection here between subjective and objective information, right? Objectively right. speaking, right? You know, the cutoff for giftedness is 130, right? That I mean, a 130 IQ score, and then we get into exceptionally profoundly gifted going on down the line, right? Where I think I spent a lot of my time, and I think the kids who end up in my office as a psychologist or in these tricky situations in schools are the kids who are in that sort of what you might call mildly gifted, right? That sort of 120 to 130 IQ range. And maybe if the ADHD or the dysgraphia wasn't there, they would be into the 130s. So it's like, right. It's it's like having a powerful engine, but a governor on it. Like, so if we can move Mm. the governor, can we do the thing? Well, but wait, 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 sorry, Brad. I don't mean to interrupt you, but this, this just in, right. So think about a neurodiverse kid and hyper-focus, right? So sort of, if we were to evaluate their intelligence based on the things that they were really interested in, instead of like general shit, excuse my French, can I say, I can swear on the podcast, can I? It's your podcast. (laughs) I have now. It's too late now. (laughs) No, but if we were to evaluate giftedness on, stuff that they're interested in rather than, you know, a more general sorts of topic, would these kids be more apt to, to hit the bar just because we're, the testing is off. I don't know. I'm making it up, but. No, it's the same thing with, with race and socioeconomic levels. If you bring the test to meet the child, you're going to have different outcomes, but. Well, the best evaluative processes are multidimensional. I mean, You know, and there are many of my colleagues do this work at a far broader scale than I do, right? Because they have university grant funding. But, you know, one of the things I do is when I go to schools and I talk to teachers about this, I say, give me your kids with straight A's, right? I want to see those kids, but give me the kids who are a pain in the ass. I see, I curse too. So, I mean, we're both. There we go. Now we're even. That's not my fault. You know, I I, I never do. You know that, right? No, I never, ever do. You never do. I was like, when you're in a faculty meeting and that kid comes up and half the room's like that kid and the other kids like, half the room's like that kid. I'm like, those are my kids, right? Because, you know, yeah. listen, gifted means intelligent. It doesn't mean successful in school, right? right. And that's a fundamental thing. Smart isn't easy and many smart kids don't get good grades, right? They'll crush it in the things they love or they're so disengaged with school, they sort of sail by with B minuses and everybody goes, huh, you know, there's a phenomenon that we call the gifted C. So if you're a really bright kid, right, you're going to get A's in all your tests and papers because that's a performative thing. But if you're going to get zeros on your class participation in homework, because you don't remember them and that averages out in the, in the wash to be a C. So I say, who are the kids who piss you off? And the teachers will give me a handful of names. And I love evaluating or meeting those kids because those Mm -hmm. are the kids that if we do a good job, we're catching them and activating the potential rather than sort of letting them like bumble through school as this sort of frustrated kid. Cause once that narrative takes hold of Johnny won't work to his potential. It's always the voice, right? It's like Johnny. Well, and it's, that's the line, right? On every, mm-hmm. if, if you go back as an adult, when you're diagnosed, you go back and look at your report. Not cards, working to their potential. Always not living up to potential, working to potential. Let's go shift it to the parent for a second. Yeah. So, I mean, how, I mean, there's an advocacy role here. There's an identification role here. There's a tolerance role here. I mean, what are some of the things that are really important to parents to think about when they're dealing with a kid who's 2E and, and maybe not doing well in school or bored or whatever it is. So knowledge is power, right? And I, one of the reasons I was attracted to what you guys do is that so much of what you do is empowering parents through knowledge, not right. just do this, but do it with this information. Right. Ergo, understand this. this. Understand so you yes. can fight better, right? And one of the things that I talk about a lot is you know, that's the reason you call somebody like me, right? So I can come with you to a meeting virtually or in person and say like, hey, here's how these kids work. Here's how these kids tick. Do these things and things will get better for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. From gym class to janitors to the school counselor, I guarantee you these things will get better if you make these things. So that's the, you know, so knowledge is power. The other side of it from just a purely parenting role, right, is that, 
most neurotypical kids, kids without different brains, develop synchronously. So a 10-year-old neurotypical kid is 10-year-old academically, intellectually, socially, and emotionally, and in terms of physical development, right? What's the word you just used? Synchronous. They are they're synchronous in, synchronous in their development. It's all in sync together. Right. Gifted, twice exceptional neurodiverse kids develop asynchronously out of sync. Right. So what we see all the time is you'll have a 10 year old kid who has the intelligence of a 15 year old, the social skills of a nine year old, the emotional right. regulation of an eight year old and the physical skill and size of an 11 year old. Yeah. Help me meet that kid's needs. It's like, where do I even put them, right? And how to meet them where they are is a is a paradox, right? So, right, because it's, it's not just one thing. It's five it's, things. Right. Right. So the different layers of development that you're talking about are social, emotional, organizational, intellectual. What was the fifth? Physical. Yeah, physical. physical. Psychomotor Thank is what you. we call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many kids that I work with who do what I call reverse school. The kids who are like science, math, ELA, yeah. And then they're the like lunch, recess, gym, because they don't have those soft skills or they're, they're developing those, those skills for unstructured time. And you know, if you can do calculus, but you can't catch a ball, guess what things your peers care so more it's about? A awkward. It's a <laughs> right? little awkward, right? You yeah. know, and I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a therapy session with a kid and just practiced catching a ball or writing or going through what soccer is because those things have social value and we can't pretend they don't exist. So can yeah. we, can we level that kid up a little bit to get them to a place where they can sort of hang in what is socially normative? Can I ask a question? Cause you're using the term. I'm curious. Would exceptional or would gifted kids be considered neurodiverse? They are um, gifted without, stuff. even without two E nailed it. Right. Cause gifted brains are a different brain. Interesting. Um, Okay. For, for many reasons, right? Not the least of which is what Diane, Diane had mentioned earlier about the, the lagging executive functioning. Right. You know, but one way to think about gifted brains that are different is they will have significantly more neural connections, right? So the information that flies around the gifted brain is all super highway. It's not local roads. And so you've got this stuff that's whipping through the brain through a prefrontal cortex where your executive functioning skills are that is underdeveloped. So you've basically got, it's like, you know, it's like when like I-5 ends at a local road and everybody bottlenecks and it's like, ah, terrible, right? Like that's kind of what the gifted kid brain is like. That's where the idea of the absent-minded professor comes from. Yeah. Because it's all this smarts and knowledge and thought and creativity that crashes together the prefrontal cortex and mistakes happen. Well, and just to be clear, because Elaine, you asked the question and I want to say it again, but gifted kids is neurodiverse because their intellect is asynchronous with their executive function. Even if their executive function is at grade level, because Mm -hmm. their intellect is above grade level, there's a gap there, which makes the, the, they have an executive function delay relative to their intellect is what you're saying. You can have it relative to your, your intellect or just something that actually meets criteria for a real deficit. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah. the brain itself is different. So the gifted brain has more connections, weaker executive functioning, and a more integrated limbic system, the emotional center of okay. your brain. So there's this uh, Wait, famous- Say that again. The gifted brain, you just- Yeah. I, I talked about something. simple for you, but- <laughs> Slow it down. Right. So the gifted yeah. brain has more neural connections. Check. It okay. has a weaker executive functioning system. By definition, weaker than everybody else or weaker than weaker comparative to neurotypical kids. So a gifted kid will be here. A 10 year old gifted kid would be here in terms of of executive functioning skills. Really? It just comes online later. And the last important thing is the integrated nature of the limbic system, the emotional center of our brain. There was a famous study from Johns Hopkins University. They do a lot of the great research on gifted kids. They asked 50 gifted kids and 50 neurotypical kids to name all 50 U.S. state capitals. 
and they put them in a neural net and they watched how their brain responded to that demand task. And any demand task has a certain amount of activation, right? A little anxiety, a little excitement, you know, your brain lights up. Right. And neurotypical kids had a certain amount. Gifted kids, the whole brain was lighting up because it's just such a more integrated experience. There was just more emotion. You know, gifted kids don't get happy. They get ecstatic. They don't get sad. They get despondent, right? They don't get excited. They are like oh vibrating God. out of their skin. But is that performance and, thing? Is that kind of no, like performance thing? I used to say about one of my kids, the highs were higher and the lows were lower. Were lower. Yep. And I yeah. never knew that's what that was connected to, but you just... Yeah. Gave me this huge insight. Thank you. Yeah. It boils down, and I'm I'm glad I yeah. did. It boils down to emotional intensity. And yes. you know, if you could describe <laughs> gifted kids in one word, it's intense. Yeah. You know, and intense thoughts, intense feelings, intense behaviors, intense opinions. It's a whole thing. And that comes back to this idea of the gifted brain is different, which is why it has a seat at the table in neurodiversity just by itself. And then when you get into other exceptionalities, you know, then we double down on that, but yeah, the gifted brain Mm -hmm. is different sort of full stop. Well, and this is the question that just kind of, it is really fascinating. The thing that kind of, we need to start wrapping Diane. I know. Can I just ask this one question? Cause I'm really, I gotta know. You gotta know. Is, does that mean that there's a a disconnect in diagnosis? I mean, it's like this sort of how many, yeah. So he's nodding their heads, right? So talk about that just for a hot minute. So several of my colleagues are part of what we call the misdiagnosis initiative. And so we meet with kids and families who have diagnosis report X from either the school or another psychologist. And we look at it and we see if they got it right. And not in a like, like a nit, right. But in a, this is much more complex. And if you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it. So you know, the two big things that my kids get misdiagnosed with are autism and ADHD. I was going to say, can we talk more about this after offline? Because yeah, <laughs> this is my I do, big... I do a whole talk on differential diagnosis because yeah. it's so important. And, you know, so parents, when you listen to this, if your kid is getting services for autism and or ADHD, you have a legal right to insist on an IQ test as part of those evaluative processes. And not all of your kids, but at least some of your kids are going to be in that twice exceptional range. And once you understand that there is a gifted learning level of intervention here, it's going to make some stuff better. It's going to open doors to more services. There's incredible communities out there for 2E learners. So you have a legal right to ask for those things. And if you see scores in the 120s, 130s, then congratulations, you have a gifted kid. And you probably didn't think about it that way, but that's why I'm here talking about this. Right. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it's something we could talk about quite a bit, right? But it's, um, you know, the the neurodiverse nature of the gifted brain looks a lot like autism. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of misdiagnosis that occurs in that space. Right. And vice versa, right? Right. There's and a lot of versa. Missed, yeah. missed autism. Yeah. And you can have both, right? You can be twice exceptional with gifted and autism. So it's very muddy. And that's why specialists like me exist. Right. Well, so that's a great segue, Matt. So what, if people wanted to get to, to connect with you, get to know you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? So my professional website is www.dr mattzakreski.com and it'll be in the show notes everybody so you don't have to spell yeah. zakreski yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll spell for you <laughs> yeah there's a reason i go by dr matt right and then uh we have a really nice facebook page as well facebook.com slash dr matt that's you know it's become it started as just a gifted thing it's sort of morphed into a mental health advocacy pro lgbtq life is ridiculous. Let's all laugh about it together uh, yeah. thing. And I'm a parent myself. So I also share a lot of parenting things, both from the advice side of things, but also from the commiseration piece of it, you know, so it's, we've created a really nice community there. Um, and, you know, and I mean, please feel free to reach out to me through either one of those uh, mediums because I love to help. I love to connect with parents. I mean, this is hard. And it if is. I can, if I can make it a little less hard, then I've done my job. And you're licensed in New Jersey. Is that what New I got? New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania. Um, Great. And then through the wonder. The states that, that don't require licenses. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> um, and we, through the magic of SciPact, um, I can, as long as I maintain my licenses in these states, I can work with people in states who accept SciPact. But I'm always happy to consult, even if I can't legally do therapy in your state. I'm happy to, you know, point you in the right direction, connect you with resources, because basically every state has an organization for supporting gifted education. So, you know, I'm always happy to connect you with my colleagues where, wherever I can. Great. Super. And if you're a parent and you're looking for support from your, for yourself, you know, make sure yeah. to come to impactparents.com, check out our programs, get some help for you as well. Yeah. Lane, sorry. No, it's all good. So we are way over time and it's totally fine because this was a fabulous conversation. Um, tell us, is there anything else that you want to share? Either something you want to a highlight you want to hit from what we've talked about or something we haven't talked about that you want to make sure you don't leave without sharing today? And I'm going to speak directly to my parents out here. So this is hard, right? Yep. I mean, it's like a beautifully overly simplified idea. But what I see from a lot of parents is they do what I call top-down thinking, that good parenting is this, and anything I do below this is bad. Mm. I'm going to encourage you to invert that and do bottom-up thinking. Your kids are awake, they are fed, they have a roof over their head, and there's Wi-Fi, which means they're probably pretty okay. (laughs) You know, anything you do additional to that, feeding them meals, getting them snacks, taking them to the park you know, buying that, that one kind of applesauce, the only kind of applesauce they'll eat, right? All of that is additive. So don't think about parenting as a deficit-based model. Think about it, try to think about it as value added because everything you do to meet your kids' needs is moving you closer towards the highest level of parenting you can reach. So when you think about Love things it. top down, right? Thank and, you, you. Know, think about, if you think about it like a test, right? You're supposed to get 100 on a test. You've got 97. It means, ah, I got a problem wrong versus I got 97. Yeah, 97. I, I do 97% of that test. Yeah. That's pretty darn good. So I find that when I allow myself to think about things bottom up, I feel better as a parent and I do better as a parent. And you're going to you're gonna be in a better better mindset and energy with your kids when you do that. We often talk about good enough. Like sometimes right. we just need to give ourselves permission parenting. for it to be good enough. Good enough. Right. Yeah. Awesome. It's really powerful. Matt, wrap us up with a motto, a quote, something to leave our audience with. Well, I have many mottos and quotes, and I'm well known for my therapy like go-to lines. My favorite thing, and I did prep this, uh, is a quote from the great Maya Angelou, uh, who's my professor while I was at Wake Forest University. Oh, um, I'm so jealous. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, we, if we ever get a chance to talk about imposter syndrome, I will tell you my Maya Angelou imposter syndrome story. It will blow your mind. Awesome. Um, but suffice it to say, do the best you can until you know better, then do better. Yeah. So if you are listening to this podcast and you're like, I didn't even know these things were a thing. Of course you didn't. This is not information that is readily available. It's in no parenting books or the very niche parenting books. It's in ours. Yeah. It's in ours. Just so you know, it is in the essential guide to raising complex kids. So you got, you got some resources, right? Yeah. So if this is all news to you, then don't beat yourself up for not doing anything about a thing you didn't know about. Now that you do, if this inspires you to look into it and get connected to these communities and supports, then welcome. There's room for you at the table bring a snack. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Thank I you, love Matt. It. We yeah. often what talk a- about that in terms of the notion of up until now, right? Up until now are the three words that can change your life because there's nothing you can do about anything that happened up until now. But from here forward, as you say, as Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you can do better. And so you can, you can take action from here forward without beating yourself up for anything that's happened up until now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The best time to start was five years ago. The second best time to start is right, right, right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. And on podcast and go out into the world and change lives. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's beautiful. <laughs> what a fun awesome. conversation. Thank you so much, Matt, for being Yay. with us today. I love, I love being a fun podcast guest. I don't want to be a boring podcast. <laughs> it was awesome. It's just it was what awesome. we needed. It's a perfect way to start the day. Anything else to those of you listening, rock on. You're doing what you need to do just by being here, listening, engaging, thinking, processing, understanding, accepting, managing. That's what it's about. And each day you're going to get up and you're going to start again, right? 
Mm-hmm. So know that you make a difference every day by being the present, conscious, engaged parent that you can be that day, right? Anything else you want to add? No, thanks. That was perfect. All right. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school.